trying to work out pattern. Yes, yeah, so we've been talking this morning about pattern because uh, just like my wedding speech, I didn't, we didn't really prepare for this also. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, that was a bad move. I know. But so welcome to the UTR Professional <laughs> Symposium. If you got in. You're a professional. <laughs> and we expect you to act that way. So that's the extent of our pattern. But welcome to the Under the Radar Symposium. Thank you for making your way here uh, early morning uh, in between ISPA uh, before arts presenters and taking the time to be with us to have some conversations and to see old friends. Uh, and Mark? Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. I wanted to thank uh, a few people. Well, there's going to be a lot of thanking. This is the beginning of the thing. Um, First of all, this, this, we've been having a great time putting this festival together, and it's due to the staff of the Public Theater, and we also have our own core staff, and I need to acknowledge Andrew Kircher, who's our associate director, partner in crime, and uh, program associate, Lily Lamb Atkinson, who is responsible for giving you tickets, the production manager, John Brené, um, company manager, Barry Bradford, is he still? He's probably at the airport right He's now. probably at the airport. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, in our producing apprentice, uh, Margarita Bergamo Mongini. Is that a different thing? I know. Um, and the under the radar interns, uh, Emily Caffrey and Madeline Barash. And uh, the baby in residence, Frankie Ting. <laughs> and my partner, <laughs> Mei Yin Wah. Uh, and then we also have to thank our supporters and funders, of course, uh, you know, uh, for the Public Theater, the Laura Sutti Mertz Foundation, and uh, the continued support of Ford Foundation for the festival, Robert Sterling Clark, the W Trust, Select Equity, Mark Kruger, Charitable Trust, and the Face Foundation, Cultural Services of the French Embassy, the Chilean Embassy, NIFA, and all the supporters and the partners of the festival and of the shows. Uh, it's uh, incredible the amount of uh, love that, that we get from uh, the partners, and uh, it would not happen without them and you. Okay. Yeah. Can I just like a, there used to be a guy who would come around here quite often, uh, and he'd hang out in the back of the Joe's <coughs> Pub and listen to new bands, uh, and he'd slip in and out of theaters. He lived down the block. and. Uh, so many of our artists owe him a huge debt, and he made so much of this work possible that you're gonna see this weekend. And just by his example and his fierce artistic independence, and I wanted to dedicate this festival to David. Thank you. And uh, to start us off, I would like to welcome Luis Castro, who's the acting commissioner of the New York City's Mayor Office for Media and Entertainment to tell you a little bit more about what's happening with the mayor's office and to welcome uh, you for, to New York. He was most recently an executive with HBO programming, but a real friend of the public from his time as executive director of philanthropic initiatives at Time Warner in New York City, where he created and oversaw the Time Warner New Works New Voices Fund, uh, a fund for best-in-class artist development programs that support emerging playwrights and screenwriters. So I'd like you to welcome Luis Castro. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Good morning. Excellent. Great. Listen, it is really my pleasure to welcome you here today to the Under the Radar Symposium. And to those of you who've come from out of town, um, the artists, the producers, the presenters, I'd like to welcome you to New York City. First, let me thank Mark and Mayen and everyone at the Under the Radar Festival. For the past dozen years, Under the Radar has helped redefine theater making. It's given a platform to countless diverse and boundary-breaking storytellers. You have been an integral part of fostering diversity of voice, perspective, and aesthetic in the arts, and we thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Oscar, Patrick, and all of our very good friends at the Public Theater. I cannot begin to articulate the impact that the public has had on theater and the careers of artists here in New York City and, and frankly, globally. The Public Theater is an institution, an integral part of New York's cultural fabric, and a reflection of what the arts in New York are, diverse, original, thought-provoking, and vital. I also want to thank APAP and each of you, the presenters and producers here today. Your dedication to finding and showcasing cutting-edge makers is helping give voice to new generations and shaping the future of the art. Mario, thank you for what you do and what APAP does. This marks the first time that the mayor's office is working with APAP 
and we are proud and excited to be a part of this year's conference. And what better place than New York to host these important gatherings? New York is home to, diverse, to a diverse and talented community of artists. Diversity and creativity go hand in hand. They are the cornerstone of the work that you do, the work that we all do. Creativity and diversity of background, of experience, of aesthetic, of perspective are what challenge the status quo. They are what enable us to see and create things differently. Here in New York, from Broadway stages to theaters and presenting organizations throughout the five boroughs, theater is a rich, vibrant part of our economic and cultural life. Through the Mayor's Office of Film, Theater, and Broadcast, we seek to advance New York's theater industry. We work to highlight the impact that theater has in New York City. We seek to support and promote career opportunities in the industry for New Yorkers of all backgrounds. And we seek to build partnerships to help make theater experiences available to all New Yorkers and to visitors alike. Here with me today is, is Carla Hope Miller. She's our Director of Theater Strategic Partnerships. She'll be attending the shows and conferences today and throughout the week. And so I encourage you to find her, talk to her, and learn a little bit more about the work that we're doing. So just, I wanna say again, thank you for the work that you do to provide opportunities to the makers here and promote live performance at its very best. Have a wonderful symposium and conference. Thanks, Luis. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Under the Radar's original and most constant partner, Mario Garcia Durham, who's the CEO of the Association of Performing Arts Presenters. This is Mario's sixth year in the job, and it has been a pleasure working with him and his staff. Before Mario was running APAP, he served as director of the Arts Community and Presenting Program at the National Endowments for the Arts. And I first met him as the artistic director of San Francisco's Yerba Buena Arts Center. Mari was a visionary and a great spokesman for our field, and it's an honor to welcome him to our stage. Thank you, Mario. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. <laughs> so um, it is, you know, I am such a big gay gay man. Like, big game. <laughs> and it is so hard. It's not hard running the conference. It's not hard doing this. The hardest thing of my job is finding out what color lanyard we have so I can match my top. That is really hard. <laughs> it's like secret information. It's really hard to do. But uh, anyway, welcome to all of you. Thank you, Mark, for that gracious introduction. Congratulations to Mayan, Mark, uh, Oscar, Andrew, um, and thank you, Luis, for your uh, warm words. Uh, congratulations to Under the Radar for 12 years. Can we hear applause for that? <laughs> you know, the only downside of that is they're just going to start going into puberty, and it's not going to be pretty. I can just tell you right now. Anyway, um, uh, on behalf, formally on behalf of arts presenters in our board, uh, I want to congratulate Under the Radar for the amazing work. Uh, we're always delighted uh, to work uh, with Under the Radar and their staff, and this is um, my official first step as we head into our conference. Um, I wanted to uh, invite you all uh, to uh, tomorrow's session. We have uh, speed dating from 9 to 12 at the Hilton. So please come and join us for that. And in closing, I just wanted, I feel like I'm with friends and, and family here. These are friggin' crazy ass times. And it's combining, if you're watching and listening, there's like nationalism, paranoia, fear, anger, overt racism, uh, and willful ignorance on so many topics and issues. So at these times, it's so critical for me to work with organizations like Under the Radar, with colleagues like yourselves, and also most importantly, to nourish the voices of artists at this time. So I applaud all of you and our artists for the work we're doing. Thank you, God bless, and I will see you later. Thank you all. Thank you, Mario. Uh, I am very happy to introduce to you uh, my friend Jeff Chang, although we were just speaking backstage and uh, uh, we've only known each other for a, a year or so at a Youth Speaks conference in the Bay Area, but it feels like I've known him for a longer time. I remember sitting next to him at that conference and feeling like a little fangirl because this was the guy who literally wrote the book on hip-hop. 
Jeff Chang has written extensively on culture, politics, and the arts, and wrote the book Hip Hop with a who wrote the book on hip-hop with Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A History of the Hip-Hop Generation, which won the American Book Award and many other awards. His new book, Who We Be, The Colorization of America, was released in 2014, and both books are fantastic, engrossing, and eye-opening reads on the political and economic history of the U.S. through the lens of arts and culture. Jeff has been a Ford Fellow, uh, Ford Fellow in Literature, and he co-founded Culture Strikes and Color Lines, and he has written for The Nation, New York Times, The San Francisco Chronicle, Foreign Policy, among many others. And he currently serves as the Executive Director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford University. So please welcome my friend, Jeff Chang. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good, 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 good. Um, thank you so much to uh, me and let me, let me just get this going here. Um, to Mark, to the amazing staff here, the public, uh, the UTR staff, and APAP staff for uh, the kind invitation. Um, this is no way to, to, to sugarcoat this. So let's just get right into what Mario is talking about. Uh, we are living in crazy ass times. Um, these are times that have been defined by by names, Laquan McDonald, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, uh, by hashtags Black Lives Matter. Americans right now, polls show that Americans right now uh, are more concerned about race relations than at any time since 1992, which was of course the Los Angeles riots. And the previous spike in concern around race and race relations was 1965, over a half century ago. It was the year of Selma. It was the year uh, of the uh, passage of the Voting Rights Act, the Immigration and Nationality Act, the, the peak right, of the civil rights movement. The last time that this nation had a consensus for racial equality and cultural equity. Not incidentally, it was also the same year that the National Endowment for the Arts uh, was formed. And then in the summer, the Watts riots broke out. And that moment begins to mark the start, if you will, of the post-civil rights era, right? It's a era that's been defined by this rich, vital culture born of the demographic changes made uh, of the civil rights legislation and a politics at the same time of racial backlash. And so 1965, 1992, 2014, 2015, 2016, Every generation seems doomed to return to the question of Rodney King's, can we all get along? And we find ourselves in strange paradoxical times. We have a black president, and yet we still have to affirm that black lives matter. We see in our media, in our culture, uh, a rainbow country full of happy faces, but all indices show that we actually are experiencing intensifying racial inequality, cultural inequity, and resegregation. It doesn't seem so long ago, 2008, right, to be exact, that Obama, Barack Obama, presented himself uh, as a symbol of reconciliation. Literally, a black and white man colorized <laughs> into red, white, and blue with the word hope attached to him. Uh, and so when he's running for office, people start using this strange word, right, post-racial. Uh, and when he's elected, many believe that we have suddenly thrown off the weight of history, that we've launched into a new era of colorblindness. But just as soon as they did, the backlash sets in. And so Obama becomes a symbol of all things other, right? Not just black, not just a product of miscegenation, but also suddenly a Muslim, a socialist, a quote unquote illegal alien. And the culture wars were now back in full swing. And this is something, of course, that he alluded to in his State of the Union address the other night, saying that his biggest regret was the rancor and the strife that he was leaving behind, that he could not help to reconcile the polarization in the country. And so instead, here at the Obama era, and yet it's not hard to find a crazy picture of Donald <laughs> Trump. Um, but here at the end of the Obama era, right, we see Trump, we see Carson using racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, using anti-immigrant, anti-black calls uh, to move to the top of the Republican polls. And yet, I think, that in times of trouble, right, in times of flux like this, I think, like Mario, that we here in this room somehow managed to be at our best. 
we do so much of our work in the shadow of the mainstream, sort of in the subterranean reaches of the national consciousness, that we see things before they're happening. And so we know that cultural change always precedes political change. And that's part of the reason that we do what we do, right? We, like the visionaries of Occupy, of Black Lives Matter, the young dreamers, we felt this in our bones. This lack of resolution, this growing social conflict, this desire for transformation. And now that these justice movements have begun to transform the way that many in the public see possibility, we find ourselves once again called to act in our art and in our practice and to push it even further. And so we've seen this uh, amongst fellow artists, uh, what they've been doing. So four years ago, Kendrick Lamar was just another kid trying to sling his mixtapes, trying to get heard. And now he's become one of a handful of artists, uh, like fellow musicians D'Angelo, Kamasi Washington, writers like ta Coates, Claudia Rankin, Roxanne, Roxanne Gay, uh, the directors, uh, Ava DuVernay, Ryan, uh, Ryan Coogler, contemporary artists like uh, the How Do You Say Yam and African Collective, uh, Kara Walker, who have helped us to better see uh, the moment of justice movements that we're living through. And in turn, justice movements have helped us to see issues of equity in the arts world. And so we can think of Viola Davis's extraordinary speech at last year's Golden Globes, right, in which she called out Hollywood on its exclusion of women of color from starring roles, that the only thing that separates women of color from anyone else is opportunity. Or we can think about Spike Lee's comments earlier this year when he received uh, an honor, or earlier la late last year when he received an Oscar for Lifetime Achievement, and he said that it's easier to become president of the U.S. as a black person than to become the head of a studio. And so here we are, right, in the middle of a moment that's rife with tension, but also rife with opportunity. And how do we get here, and where are we going? For that, we can start with young folks, the thermometer of our society. And the first fact to note is that this generation, despite being the most diverse generation that the U.S. has ever seen, has grown up during an era of resegregation. Over the last 25 years, schools have been resegregating at an alarming rate. And so it shouldn't be any surprise that we've seen the return of student protests to campus from Oberlin in 2012 to Missouri in 2015. Young people demanding a renewed attention to questions of equity. And they've brought out the other haters, right? Uh, Todd Gitlin, a former student protester, asked, why are today's students so fearful? And he suggests they're too coddled, they're too sensitive, they're not adequate to the task of building social movements. The neoliberal Thomas Friedman wrote yesterday that we're living in an age of protest, and he said, there is surely a connection between the explosion of political correctness, I'm gonna put that in scare quotes, <laughs> emphasis on the scare, of political correctness on, campus, on college campuses, including Yale students demanding the resignation of an administrator whose wife defended free speech norms that might make some students uncomfortable, and the ovations Donald Trump is getting for being crudely politically incorrect. These are contradictory arguments, right? Are these student protesters, are they a mob of anti-free speech bullies? Or are they a fearful mass of coddled and oversensitive wimps? What are they? <laughs> of course, they're neither, right? There was a sage philosopher, he once said, these children that you spit on as you try to change their worlds are immune to your consultations, right? <laughs> he said, don't tell them to grow up and out of it. Where's your shame? You've left us up to our necks in it. And so haters, afraid of change, always drive, uh, draw these false equivalencies to equate student protests against institutional racism with the ending of free speech, as if calling out racism and demanding change is the same as issuing racist calls to extremism. Critics like Gitlin and Friedman, they, have, they act as if they have no idea how power works. Students of color can only build power insofar as they band together, and then they can still be ignored, and they've been ignored for years, and then that's actually the definition, right, of racism, right? institutional neglect, it's the definition of power. And so when students protest, it's not anti-free speech, it's the practice of free speech. Discomforting power is not the same as power enforcing discomfort. Speaking up against injustice is exactly what democracy is supposed to look like. So students are calling us to see more clearly that achieving diversity is not the same as achieving equity. 
They were speaking out in Missouri against their own invisibility, a contradictory kind of invisibility. It depends upon them being seen only in a certain kind of way as added value. Uh, the value uh, that they provide is diversity to the university. It's not the same as being seen and valued for their full humanity because that would require that the university believe that they need to act on their needs. And instead, the universities only act when justice movements push them to do so. And so student protests across the country are a performance, right? Directed at power. And they're also a performance of power. They're a proposition about how to get everyone in the community uh, to think about community and to make necessary change in a time and a place where the language of diversity has grown comfortable and stale and empty. Because just getting everyone into the same brand of clothing is not transformative, yeah. right? <laughs> it's diversity turned to conformity, right? Mm -hmm. So what students are saying is we have to move beyond the mere appearance of diversity to the practice of equity. And so they ask us to confront issues, again, of access, right? Who has access to the means of the production of culture? Who has access to cultural knowledges of representation? Who is represented in cultural production and the structure of cultural production? How does the representation, misrepresentation, or underrepresentation <coughs> impact the notion of quality, right? And the reproduction of inequality and power. Who has the power to shape culture and cultural production? Who has the power to allocate resources in an equitable manner? Um, seeing these protests in a lot of ways uh, has been a very personal thing. I work on the campuses, um, of course, and, and in these students I, I see a lot of of what happened to me when I was a student uh, during the period of the late 80s and the early 90s, a period that was marked by Culture Wars Part One, if you will. It was a story of my generation to come of age after the Civil Rights Movement in the post-Civil Rights era. Uh, we were then the most diverse generation that the nation ever seen. Um, and I was part of the first class at UC Berkeley that was more than half non-white. And we were the fruits of civil rights victories. We were the fruits of the multicultural uprisings. We were manifesting their victories in the appearance of our own bodies, which turned up on these campuses in larger numbers than anybody had ever anticipated. And as they do now, liberals and conservatives joined in a critique of student protests. They called us anti-democratic. They called us oversensitive uh, when we were calling for access and representation. And then these critics expanded their efforts to critique artists of color, queer artists, feminist artists, and they were successful in destroying the second great US effort to establish, establish excuse me, a truly progressive cultural policy. They used these attacks against students, against artists of color, queer artists, feminist artists, progressive artists, as a way to push towards a privatization of culture and to attack multiculturalism. In some ways, they were incredibly successful. So this is a graph of NEA funding, which all of you, many of you I'm sure know very well. 1966 to 2015, the blue graph is, uh, is the, the numbers in nominal value, right? And the red graph is in, in adjusted uh, real uh, numbers, adjusted for inflation. And so the peak came within the first uh, 13 years of its founding, right? The US committed more to the arts than at any time since the New Deal. And at its peak in inflation-adjusted numbers, the NEA received the equivalent of nearly half a billion dollars in 1979, half a billion dollars in 2015 uh, numbers. And so the result was this creation of rich ecosystems, arts ecosystems, all across the country. And in, in fact, an infrastructure that leads to a lot of the progressive art, uh, uh, the multicultural explosions that we see happening during the 1980s in the 1990s. But as a result of the culture wars, actual funding drops by more than half between 1985 and 1996, and cultural policy is effectively all but negated. And so arts and arts ecosystems, arts organizations and arts ecosystems find themselves under severe pressure, especially the performing arts, right? A field which we all know has been always strongly subsidized uh, because we believe in the power of performing arts to bring community together to entertain and to edify, and to often pose important questions. But after the culture wars, the new national cultural policy was essentially, if you can't get corporations to buy it, you don't deserve to be making art. The value of culture was reduced to merely its economic value, 
Again, this is the moment of the privatization of culture. But something else is happening at the same moment. Even as the ecosystems that created multiculturalism were being starved and dried out, a new generation brought some of its energies directly into the mainstream. And so in some ways, hip hop popularized multiculturalist ideas in a broader way than even the multiculturalism movement have been able to. It grew its own audiences, it spoke in its new way to the new affect and the new aesthetics of a new generation. 1993, the hip hop insurgency, the student insurgency, uh, these insurgencies of multiculturalism together pushed uh, these ideas into the mainstream. And so this is a cover of Time magazine. It was created, this woman was created from a proto Photoshop program. They basically took pictures of people from all these different races, put it across the top and put it across the bottom, and tried to figure out what, the, what their offspring would look like. <laughs> and so they pulled this picture out, right? Uh, uh, this is the love child of all the races of the new nation, and she, she looked a lot like Soledad O'Brien. And, <laughs> and they called her Eve. <laughs> um, multiculturalism in 1993 was suddenly edgy and hip and above all, sexy, right? But not coincidentally, this is also the moment in which multiculturalism feels like it's beginning to lose its cultural edge, and it gets attacked, right? The 1993 Whitney Biennial. Uh, again, the attacks that we're seeing in Congress. Soon, the novelist Paul Beatty is bemoaning, everything's multicultural and nothing's multicultural. And so we end up leaving the 90s with this mixed legacy, right? Artists boldly, continuing to move towards cultural desegregation in the arts in the, the mainstream, continually surprising arts institutions and the arts elite by finding new audiences, uh, by gaining success amidst changing demographics, while the ruins of the culture wars continue to smolder, which we see in the withering of thousands of arts organizations, uh, the disappearance of a lot of artists, uh, the withering of valuable rich arts ecosystems and this rising elite hostility to claims for cultural equity. So what do you do when your revolution has been co-opted, uh, pushed out, um, um, marginalized again? You might turn to subterfuge and misdirection. And so partly as a joke, partly as a, a brilliant strategy, Thelma Godin starts calling the artists uh, the turn of the millennium post-black. Um, a way to create a space for black artists in an environment that could be ideologically hostile. Or you might just bum rush the show, right? Like hip hop did, finding its own audiences until it could no longer be ignored. So again, over and over again, demographic change strikes these arts institutions that say that they're com uh, committed to diversity as surprising because the reality of diversity always exceeds the rhetoric of diversity. And this is how we survived the turn of the millennium and the Bush two years, right? In which top-down multiculturalism was less about attaining equity than about promoting a kind of wartime jingoism. And pundits would, again, soon be triumphal. They'd soon be talking about the rise of this post-war, or post-racial, excuse me, era. As if after 9-11, we had somehow all passed into this colorblind state of grace. But the larger narrative was always there. Census predictions, uh, had held that halfway into the millennium, 2050, uh, the U.S. would become a majority minority. And so 2050 suddenly seemed intriguing uh, or terrifying, depending on who you were, at least until <coughs> projections found that it was gonna happen sooner. Right? <laughs> 2042, the year it all goes to hell. <laughs> but what did it mean, right? What does it mean to be majority minority? What does that even mean? What does that sentence, or what does that phrase even mean? Uh, it meant that we all had to figure out this new question, which is, if we're all minorities, how do we form a new majority? And that question right now is a political problem that people are spending billions of dollars, right, and lots of our, our TV time <laughs> to, uh, to try to figure out, right? But in a much broader, much more enduring kind of way, this, cultural, this question is not just a political question, it's a cultural question. Uh, if we are all minorities, how do we form a new majority? And so, this is why Roberto Uno's formulation that we have to attend to the impacts of changing demographics and changing aesthetics has been so crucial to understanding the post 9-11 years. It turns our view towards a shared future and what we will make of it. How will we apply our creative powers? And what activists and artists 
have given us now is a directive to address inequality and inequity. And to make it clear, if we don't do so, we're going to be drawn back into this bad cycle of crisis, reaction, uh, backlash, complacency, crisis. Right? Just as we have been after 1965, after 1992, right now what we have is the opportunity to get it right. So I want to add one more point here regarding cultural equity in the current crisis uh, as it's being seen in the world of nonprofit arts. In the past decade, a lot of attention has been devoted to the decline in audiences for the arts, particularly in the performing arts where declines have been the most prominent. And so let's be clear, non-white attendance has held steady, white attendance has dropped, yet whites still make up 75% of the audiences. And so why is it that arts institutions who are most concerned about declining audiences continue to program and cater to the portion of their audience that's dropping off the most intensely. And this is reflected in the way that foundation money is distributed. Of every foundation dollar, 11 cents goes to the arts. More than five cents uh, goes to arts organizations with budgets of more than five million, which make up just 2% uh, of all arts organizations, right? The 2%. One cent goes to arts organizations serving underrepresented <laughs> communities, and less than half a cent goes to arts organizations for social justice work. In other words, the crisis in the arts is intimately related to the nation's crisis around race and justice and equity. The patterns of inequality in foundation funding and arts funding in particular are in fact worse. They're more severe than patterns of income inequality, which we all know, of course, is getting bad and worse. And so I want to close this talk with a story that maybe takes us back uh, to the, the stakes of the struggle. And it's, it, it goes back to 1956, uh, the end of 1956. It's been only 28 months since the young preacher, Martin Luther King Jr., had been heading the tiny Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. It's been only 10 months since the local NAACP ch uh, chapter secretary, Rosa Parks, refused to give up her seat on the bus, precipitating the Montgomery bus boycott. And it's been just eight months since King has been arrested and his home bombed by white supremacists. But at this moment, boycotts are spreading across the South. Some municipalities are explicitly outlawing segregation, but Montgomery's white elite vows to hold the line. And so King, as the head and the spokesperson of the Montgomery Improvement Association, he's suddenly a national, even international figure. He tours the U.S. to explain the association's cause and raise money for their efforts, to tell the nation why he and the civil rights marchers found it, quote, more honorable to walk in dig dignity than to ride in humiliation. And so on September 27th, he finds himself a single black passenger on an airplane flight to Norfolk, Virginia. First, he flies to Atlanta as a connecting flight. And his flight in Norfolk, uh, to Norfolk uh, develops generator trouble and is forced to turn back. And, all this time he's having his conversation with a white passenger next to him. He's having what we call now the race conversation, right? And the two men are connecting. They're connecting across the gap of segregation. And as they deplane and they head back into the terminal, they are informed that repairs will take three hours. Uh, so they're given lunch tickets to go to the airport's, airport's restaurant, which is called the Dobbs House. Now let's talk about the Dobbs House. <coughs> this concession was already notorious with African Americans in the area because at the entrance to the Dobbs house is a portly white bearded black man in an old suit who's sitting next to a high bale of cotton. And there's a low table next to him uh, with a box of cigars and a dinner bell. And so his job is to greet guests and sometimes entertain them with a song or a tale. And so in Jet Magazine, uh, they said, this was a Remus Alfonso Smith uh, picture. And they wrote a caption saying Negroes using airport facilities during airport stopovers have termed this site disgusting. And so when King told the story to audiences, he admitted that this image, right, the image of this man outraged him. It was an image of inferiority, and it got him incredibly angry. So the host uh, area, the head waiter, separates King from his white companion, right? And he leads King into a small curtain back room in the rear of the restaurant. And so King realizes what's happening. And he starts protesting. He says, I'd rather starve than eat under such conditions. 
And so he goes back into the main dining room and takes a seat and waits in vain for a long time to be served. So he's getting angry, right? The white hostess is apologetic. She's saying, I'm embarrassed. The black white stuff is coming back and they're, they're saying, we'll help serve as witnesses if you want to sue. Uh, and he's like, I've had it. I'm going to go see the manager. And so this is a, a small fight, right? By the standards of what's happening with the Montgomery bus boycott. But it's not insignificant. It leads to an epiphany for King. It becomes a central story in a lot of the speeches that he gives in the years before the March on Washington. The manager says to King, I'm bound by the laws of the state and the ordinance, uh, ordinances of the city. It's not me, it's the law. And King says, hey, I don't know if you've heard, but the law has changed, right? <laughs> Public facilities have been desegregated. But the manager's like, eh, whatever. We can't serve you here, right? But now everything's the same. Everything's equal back there. You'll get the same food. You'll be served out of the same dishes. Everything else. You'll get the same service as everybody in this main dining room. King says, I don't see how I can get the same service here. Number one, I'm confronting aesthetic inequality. <laughs> I can't see all these beautiful paintings that you have on the walls out here. You can imagine what kind of paintings these were if the man outside <laughs> is sitting next to a bale of cotton. Right? So he's being sarcastic, of course. But he's serious about aesthetic inequality. He's uh, seen all of the work that Mamie and Kenneth Clark have done, the beauty standard experience in which black children given a choice choose white dolls over black dolls. And he says later on, you see, equality is not just a matter of mathematics, it's a matter of psychology. It's not only a quantitative something, it's a qualitative something. So he's restating what Ralph Ellison had said not so long before, that as a person of color, he was invisible. He was invisible in the sense of not being seen, but he's also invisible in, seeing, in the sense of not being seen in his full humanity, law or no law. And further than that, he's been separated by, his, uh, by, by the head waiter from his white companion. Uh, their, entire disruption, their entire conversation has been disrupted. And so this separation prevents trust, reconciliation, redemption. It denies the possibility of mutuality, the creation of beloved community. We're living in a time of growing inequality and intensifying resegregation. And I think all of us in this room have dedicated ourselves to fight the condition that King put to words that night. Our work is to fight the aesthetic inequalities, right, that King spoke of, or to flip it to fight for cultural equity, to fight to be seen in all of our difference and in all of our humanity. Fighting racism now is about changing the way that we see. How do we see beyond diversity to equity, such that we aren't content with a simple kind of Noah's Ark approach to diversity, where you get two of each, right? And you put them on the boat so they can escape the, fly, the rising floodwaters, right? Uh, which are being caused by climate change, of course. <laughs> right? How do we see each other in our full humanity such that the unjust death of one is, no, is more the same as the unjust death of another? And we, in fact, make a commitment not just to stopping death, but to honoring and loving life. If we can truly see each other, perhaps we can form a more equal and just community. And that's something to believe in, and it's something to fight for. Thank you very much for listening to me. for a bit uh, so you can uh, talk to him personally if you want that during coffees and uh, he's kind of come to some of the shows. Um, now, this is a festival about risk, so we're going to really risk something. We're going to try to do something a little bit different. Um, we're going to head into our breakout sessions and it's part of our meeting. We are going to break out into groups of six. This is a Jeff's piece given me up. So there's a lot to think about. There's a lot going on these days. And I think this is, an, I, this is a room of some of the smartest people in our field. And I think let's use that. Let's use each other to, to think about and uh, consider how we're presenting in the world today. So 
Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is introduce yourselves. You have five minutes for the whole group, and please take one minute each to uh, share your name, current affiliation, and one response to the following prompt. And if you really knew me, you would know. If you really knew me, you would know. Anyway. Um, so the second part, you summer all the following questions as prompts to get a conversation started. And uh, we're going to have these, uh, you don't have to write these down, they're going to be on your table. Um, how do you view the role of arts institutions in realizing cultural equity and social change? And based on these views and your own experiences, what sort of non-monetary resources are needed to advance this work, either in your own organization, your own community, or across the field at large? Specifically, how can performance be utilized as a platform for ideas and for social change? Are there examples that would be really good for folks to know about? Again, these discussion prompts are printed and uh, available in your breakout rooms. You'll have one hour to discuss this and share amongst yourselves your experiences, challenges, and success and process. And I think there's a lot to be learned. Um, when we come back, if we uh, have enough time, we're going to take just headlines from your conversations. And that's like five minutes once we come back. Um, at the back of your badge, you will find your room assignment, which is either the library on 1M or Joe's Pub. You will also have a table number and in that room where you will meet your group and have this conversation. When we break from this plenary session, we ask you to head to your assigned room and find your table. And um, yeah, um, we have people ready to direct you and help you with that. You pick up a coffee and a Danish on your way to the room. You please get to your rooms by uh, 10.45 AM. And uh, we'll be uh, giving you uh, notes when it's time, we'll give you sort of an idea of how the hour is going. So, Come back in here and uh, we'll see you in about an hour or so. Okay, thank you very much. Everyone understand the questions? I'll see you, see you in the library.